uh, Ryan, at this time, there are two individuals who have a public comment. Okay, and is there a list that's going to be sent to me like last time, or if if not, maybe Carol, if she has it, can just read off their names for me. Yeah, I have those at this point in time. When we you want to when we get there, you want to read it off then. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so we are live on YouTube now. We are okay. All right, so now that uh, we're broadcasting, it is. Um, 12 minutes after 6 p.m. at this time, I will call to order the regularly scheduled board meeting of the Central Union High School District Board of Trustees. Um, and we are reconvening into open session. At this point, there is no action that was taken in closed session that uh, requires reporting in open session. Um, and if our IT staff is ready, if you could join me for the flag salute. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the, flag. to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. And so now we will uh, move on to communication and recognition. Uh, I'll start with our board of trustees, Trustee Garcia Reese, anything to report? Uh, no, no, thank you. Thank you, Trustee Jones, anything to report? Uh, Emma, you're, you're muted, you're muted. I would like to send my condolences to everybody at Central High School and those who knew Janet, uh, <laughs> the tragic loss of, of her and I feel so bad. Thank you, Emma. All right, uh, Mr. Jimenez. Uh, just to add my condolences to those uh, uh, employees and family members who have uh, uh, passed, uh, a relative has passed away. I, my, my, my sincere condolences to them. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Yeah, I would share those as well, but nothing else to report. Thank you, and, and I like my fellow board members um, wish to express sympathies and condolences to the entire school district family. These are difficult times um, and uh, proud of the work everybody's doing despite that. So with that, we will then move on to the superintendent's report, Dr. Andrews. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, I had planned to actually address um, the loss of our employee at the end of my comments, but since we each one of you have shared your respects, I'll, I'll change the order a little bit. So last month, um, we did lose a member of our Central Union High School team, uh, Ms. Janet Gonzalez. Uh, she was our ASB clerk and she had been with us for um, quite a few years. Uh, started out in various roles, but eventually was our ASB clerk at Central Union. Um, according to the family, on, on uh, June 10th is when she passed away during, due to complications of the coronavirus. And so her heart goes out to their family. Uh, she has three surviving children. One has just graduated just this month um, and all of her extended family. and 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 that the school is doing quite a bit for them. Um, cards have been sent and, and we look forward to attending services when they're available. At this point in time, there's no plans, but we hope to support the family as much as we can. And, and of course, more closely, there was a tribute video that was prepared by the high school and shared among the high school staff. Uh, at this moment, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like us to pause the moment for just a few moments for a moment of silence on her behalf and uh, think of her and her family. Thank you, everyone. It is, it is difficult times that many of us are facing and this one has come very close to home. And um, so we, we grieve for the family and are concerned about the children and, and those who are, are left behind. Um, on other areas, uh, in terms of my report, I wish to share some information um, about what's happening um, with the district. Uh, at the end of this session tonight uh, will be a, a a presentation, it's an update on our plans. Uh, in May, we shared quite a few questions, really, like questions that we had, and now we have uh, more answers. Um, 
So we'll have, share a presentation regarding our fall reopening. Um, like nearly all the districts in the county, we are planning on reopening with distance learning for all students to begin with. Um, and then when allowable, we would bring students on in small groups so that we can maintain physical distancing and keep everyone safe. Uh, what is clearly different is the model of learning. Uh, the fourth quarter was kind of a run and take cover and let's just get done what we can try and get done. But as we've learned, that hasn't been the most successful. Some teachers and students were really good at that and they were able to learn and others struggled. And so what we found is actually we've been able to practice more of our distance learning skills in summer school because summer school has been distance learning and it's come with its own set of challenges. But what we're looking forward to is somewhat more of a synchronous or a schedule where things are regular. Um, the pattern of learning is helpful when people know the routines and there's a schedule involved. And so our, our next, uh, we'll be presenting our ideas and plans on that. And then just recently, as, as recent as today, as, as we, the announcement of the governor's budget came out, there's an assembly bill, Assembly Bill 77, which is called the trailer bill. And that'll have more information once it's passed into law about the expectations for districts to have student learning plans and how uh, what the expectations are of schools to account for students and their attendance online and in person. So we're looking forward to more information as that becomes public and available to us. To help communicate this information around our recovery plan is there's a new web page on our district web page. Uh, if you go to the district web page, the top bar underneath, they'll say COVID-19 recovery plan. Um, that plan or that page will develop over time so that you can see additional information around our plan, uh, uh, who's attending which days. Um, there's already up there our employee safety plan for facilities, which is actually being revised and updated this week. There's the employee safety health screening every day and there's a student health screening every day. Um, so those are all things that are coming along and that'll be the primary source for all this information to turn to. We write on the district's webpage under that one. So there'll be more information we'll share at the end of this session. Uh, in business services, uh, under that topic, uh, we're pleased to uh, pleased and worried about that new announcement of the governor's budget. Uh, we're pleased to know that the governor and the legislator have agreed to fund us at a full amount. Uh, last, we had the special session in the May revise. It looked like we were facing quite a bit of reductions. Now they're offering to, to fund us at, at the same levels uh, with no cost of living increase, but at least the same levels. However, it will come with many, many very, very deep deferrals. It's the kind of thing where, you know, you get written a check for services you provide, and then the person writing the check says, but we need you to hold this check for 90 or 120 or more days, and you can't cash it. So in essence, that's what the state is doing to us, is they're going to give us the full amount, but they're going to say, ah, but don't cash this check. So we will still deal with deferrals and having to use transfers and possibly uh, borrow uh, through the trans process to cover all of our expenses. So um, it's both, it's a mixed it's mixed information. It's both good that, that we're not faced with serious cuts, but we are faced with having to pay our bills when the district or the, the state does not send us the funds to pay those bills. Uh, in, in another topic under teachers, we've filled all our vacancies. They've all been filled. We're working with our uh, staff, both our HR department, who's doing a great job, and our new teachers, helping them get all their credentialing pieces in place to get that done. Uh, graduation. We had graduations this month. Uh, they were not the same as we had expected, but it was close. We're not able to gather in person. Uh, we didn't have the logistical capacity to do a drive-through ceremony, although each school did a version of that when they picked up their um, swag and their senior swag items. Uh, they, were they were pretty great. Um, but we did have a very nicely produced, professionally produced graduation ceremonies for all three schools. Um, they were well-received and they had been viewed between three and, three and 5,000 times. Uh, they were able to be seen in Canada and countries around the world where family were able to see the graduation ceremony. Uh, we had each graduate, their name was read and their image up on the screen. There was musical performances by our students and also speeches that were pre-recorded by our students. So we appreciate all those that helped participate to make that a great ceremony. We do look forward to hopefully in the fall, hopefully in the fall, we can gather for an in-person ceremony and our schools will be ten setting some tentative dates for those, uh, but we'll still be contingent on our ability to gather in person. So those are some quick updates in my report. Um, that's what I have for now. Thank you, Dr. Andrus. And uh, now to, we'll move on to recognition of retired classified staff employees. Dr. Andrus, that has you next to it. But I, I see Carol. 
Yeah, I, I was just checking to see if we had any additional speakers. I apologize for that. So let me share with you. I'm going to uh, share my screen and uh, we're going to recognize our, our classified. Oh, my host needs to allow me to share my screen. Can you please try it again, Dr. Andrews? There we go. Thank you. So these are our, our uh, classified retirees. We're very excited about these people. They have provided us with over a hundred years of combined service to the district. Um, rather, rather tremendous. So um, it's exciting to to be able to share this information with 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 the board. Well, these will be our, our classified retirees this time. Our first one is Miss um, Alicia Frausto, and Miss Frausto is has been with us for 24 years. Um, she has been a child care assistant um, for all those for many of those years, and she retires with us with all that um, time in serving in our child care facility. Um, over the many years, served um, hundreds and hundreds of littles and helped teen parents um, learn how to take care of their children. So we're very excited about um, her her retirement. I don't believe Ms. Frausto is on the call to join us or make any comments. Is there? Is she on the call? No, Dr. Andrews, she's not on the thank call. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't believe so, but thank you very much. We're just checking. Um, next. Next. I think this is a name we all know. Up next is Henry. Um, we just know him as Henry. Henry. <laughs> so, so there are some staff sitting nearby. Uh, they're actually in, in the boardroom, as you can see, uh, if you're able to see the screen, they're there. And we're very excited about Henry. Um, 36 years of service. Um, he, he has had the same position as one of our custodians for all that time. Um, I got to know him a year ago as he came in and helped me bring boxes in out of my car and get set up in the office. And as I got to know him, and then I've had a chance to see him all around the district. So serving so many other people, um, we're really not quite sure what to do when he retires. We're trying to uh, figure out what, how we're going to fill that, that position and, and what, what, I don't even think there's a job description that actually we, we could do for that, but we're, we're appreciate him. Um, He's excited to spend time with his family, his brother-in-law. Um, I think it's Lydia and Brian and uh, nephew, Justin. Um, his hobbies, he likes to help everybody. We all know that about him. Loves taking pictures. What does he miss most about the job? It's the people, faculty and staff, working with our you know, people here, getting to know them. He's got some retirement plans. He's going to travel and see family. Um, and he's a little something about him is that he makes some excellent, excellent guacamole. So <laughs> get that to the next party. All right. Thank you, Henry, for all those years of service. All right. Our next retire. Oh, Henry, did you want to make a comment? I see you, but I don't think you were going to say anything. Are you going to say anything? Well, I guess, uh, Dr. Anderson, I say that, you know, it was really nice, you know, working with you guys uh, here at the district office. And, man, it's just that. It's gonna be kind of hard, you know, to leave everybody here at the Central High School District for many years. It's just that um, it's gonna be kind of weird coming by here every morning, stopping by, check on the girls in here, and you know, we have to have. We always have fun because you know, it's just that I love them. You know, we always <laughs> joke around and stuff like that. You know. <laughs> I might see my good friend over on the right side over there against the wall over there. <laughs> oh, he's a dodger, you know, we always call it a big, uh, what's up, Chinga Dara with three solo? <laughs> I'm sorry to say, doctor. <laughs> well, like I say, you know, it's going to be hard you know, for me and stuff like that, you know, coming by here and stuff like that. The board members, they're awesome. I love them. How many years? I know all these. Different people and stuff like that, all those board members, you know. It's like I say, you know, I don't know what else. I'm going to miss you, Henry. It's like, uh, like I say, it's, I'm really, you know. We love you, Henry. Thank you, man, Henry. Thank you so much. I love you guys. We love you. you. Know, the board members. I can't see you guys on the face now. I saw uh, Emma Lee. I'm going to be Jay Jimenez. Hi, Maria. Wish you the best. I think I saw Steve Walker in there. 
got a few offers, you know. <laughs> well, I think I'll thank you guys for stepping in. And Mr. Garcia, I went to school with her too. I didn't remember her in high school at all. Well, thank you. Well, you know, Carol, uh, Mrs. Taylor, Carol Taylor, love you too. Well, thank you. <laughs> hey. Woo! So we appreciate all those years of service. Um, up next is Jesse Preciado with 25 years of service. And here she is also on the side. It's here in the, in the screen there. Um, Jesse's been with us for 24 years. Nine months is what's here. Um, she's our HR admin secretary. Um, she's been educational services secretary. She's on our, been on our wellness committee, um, various other things. Um, she's got time now to spend with her family and son-in-law and daughter and some new grand and granddaughters and a new one just arrived recently. A um, couple of hobbies that she has, of course, are her granddaughters. I can appreciate that. She also is a fitness instructor, and she really enjoys watching over her granddaughters. So we know where her heart is. Um, what she's going to miss most is her department and helping um, organize events for our employees, um, getting to know all of our employees, getting to know them, as she has been crucial in bringing them on board. Um, again, just like with Henry, we're trying to figure out how do we do this with some of our key people who've really refined their skills and, and hone their practice to help our people. Um, her plans, yes, helping her daughters and I think watching the granddaughters is part of that. Uh, <laughs> traveling over to family over in the San Diego area. So we're excited for her. Um, so uh, with that, Jess, if you want to share a couple of thoughts, we'd love to hear from you. Um, no, I wanted to thank everybody. Um, I started off there at Southwest when it just opened and um, we were all cramped at Central and then we split up and and so I started there as the receptionist there at Southwest. That was really, really cool to start at a brand new school. Then I came here and worked at educational services. And then when there was cuts and everything, um, the HR secretary left and I kind of took in her place there. And I really like it. I mean, getting to know all the employees and everything and our department, oh, what can I say about our department? It, it's awesome. You know, we work as a team. Um, I don't know, I'm gonna miss it a lot. Um, the business department, my work wife, Melinda. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I wanna just thank everybody for always um, their support and everything. Um, my family, because they really put up with a lot. There's my husband. Hey. <laughs> um, my family and, and my children, I mean, they're my biggest supporters and my biggest cheerleaders there. So I'm really happy, um, I'm sad too, because with all this new stuff coming up and, and so many things that need to be done, I, I feel like, gosh, I hope I did the right thing, but I wanna thank you all, all for your, for, for your support and, and your encouragement here. Thank you. Woo! Yeah. I love you, P1. And, and our last retiree we're recognizing today is Maria Tariquez. Uh, Maria has been um, with us for 24 years. She's uh, currently our accounting technician one. She works in ed services here in the district office. <laughs> all of our um, federal, state and federal program dollars are all spent and tracked accordingly, um, helping uh, support uh, Ms. Sherry Hart with all of her projects, which are many, many projects, including all the LCAP uh, funding goals and activities that are, occur around that. Um, she's been a sec at various levels of secretary support over the 24 years at various places uh, within the district. What she misses most is the great people and agencies that she that we collaborate with, including the county office, the community college, and IVROP. So those are, um, we're excited for her, but I don't believe Maria is on tonight. I don't think she's on the call. I didn't think she was going to join us tonight. Is she there, anyone? She is not on the call. Thank you. We appreciate Maria and her many, many years of service. Um, she's been a mainstay, and... Um, I have a little, a little uh, trepidation as both um, Ms. Tariquez is retiring this month and Sherry at the end of uh, this year. Um, th there's a lot of learning and knowledge that uh, these folks take with them. But at this point in time, we're ce celebrating Maria and we wish her all the, well, all the best in retirement. So with that, we're 109 and a half years of service combined for our four retirees. And we are delighted that, uh, for their next steps in their lives. So we appreciate that. All right, thank you very much. That's all I have for recognition. So with that,
Did we lose Mr. Childers? Steve is muted. So I think, I think at the moment, I don't see uh, Mr. Childers on the call as an attendee. I don't see him either. All right. Uh, let's check and see if we can get a hold of him, see if he can join us again. He might have had to step away. Jay, Jay, Mr. Jimenez, you may need to step in here in a few minutes. Yes, I'm, I'm looking at the, the agenda. I'll call him, Ward. Oh, it says he's trying. He's texting me back, trying to log back in. My signal was weak in my area. I don't know about uh, uh, Ryan. He's Yeah, he just replied to my text saying that he's trying to log back in. Sometimes it helps to send the email again. I don't know if Carol can send it again. So I've taken off my video because it keeps just falling on me. That is correct. If you have a weaker signal, it's helpful to turn your video off. Do we have anyone signed in, signed up for public comments? Yes, we have Amanda Hill wanting to make comments on CTE. I will promote her right now. We're on, uh, we're on uh, Mr. Ryan Sheffers. Uh, Mr. Ryan. Uh, before, uh, hold on, uh, hold on just a moment. Uh, before you proceed, I just want to make sure if, uh, give a word from Ryan, uh, if you, Mr. Childers. So he's uh, he's having some computer trouble. He said he said he's got a problem with his computer. He's going to restart his computer. Shall we go ahead and introduce public comment session? Uh, other Amanda's on standby. Mm -hmm. I suppose yeah. you might wait just a few more minutes. We'll see okay. if we can get on here. We'll wait a couple more minutes, then we'll probably need to proceed. Okay. Thank you for your patience.
Uh, Mr. Jimenez, why don't you go ahead and uh, proceed until Mr. Uh, Childers rejoins us. Okay, we're at uh, agenda number eight, public comment session. At this time, the board <laughs> trustees will hear comments, presentations, or requests on matters listed on this agenda <clears throat> or other topics that are not Excuse me. on the agenda. Did we, uh, did we approve the agenda? Uh, that's after the public uh, comments. Okay. And uh, so we have one person, I think uh, we have Amanda Hill. Amanda, could you start please? Good evening, Amanda Hill, resident of Alpine. Um, I am here to speak on behalf of our CT department at Southwest High School. Um, I just wanted to invite you all to like our new Facebook page. It's Southwest High CTE. Uh, it was something that we started this school year to promote our CTE programs at Southwest to showcase what current events we have going on um, and to make sure that was communicated to the, the residents of El Centro and our stakeholders within the district. Um, during the summer, we've taken the time to reach out to some of our clients. <coughs> Most of our programs are over the 10 year mark now at Southwest. So it's really exciting to go back and look and see what our students have been up to. We're proud to report that we have um, our SACS pathway has promoted a lot of wonderful healthcare professionals. We have dentists and uh, students that are going on to be scientists, working on PhDs, uh, pharmacists. It's very, very exciting. So please take a look at that. Um, this week, we're highlighting those students that chose to follow the career path um, right after high school. Um, so we reg did a registered dental assistant. We have a combat medic in the army. Um, and some entrepreneurs coming this week that don't have their own businesses. So please take a look at that Southwest High CTE on Facebook. We really appreciate it. Um, also, we want to congratulate our um, classified retirees. Um, we worked with Maria Tarikas very closely in our department, and she was an integral part of making sure the funding was there to support our CTE students. We'd also like to thank Henry for his countless uh, back breaking hours, setting up blood drives, and he brought me chairs and tables every cafe for the last 10 years. So I really appreciate it. I'm going to miss him. So whoever takes his position is going to have some big shoes to fill. Um, hope everyone is doing well and staying safe. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, thank you very much. And I understand that our next comment is from Don Jeffers. We don't have, uh, Mr. Jeffers is not on the call. Okay, is there anyone else left who is on the call that wishes to speak? Uh, excuse me, I might have misspoken. I think it's Ryan Jeffries. Oh, Ryan Jeffries, okay, Mr. Apologize. Jeffries. No problem. Is there a Ryan Jeffries on the call? Uh, no, sir. Oh, okay. Ryan, could I have uh, a Mrs. Hill repeat that uh, Facebook uh, site? Or did somebody catch it? It's Southwest High CTE. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mrs. Hill. Okay, um, well, if the IT staff could just let me know if any of those who wish to speak end up showing up and we'll make uh, arrangements for them to go ahead and give that uh, their public comment. But in the meantime, we'll move on. This time I will uh, entertain a motion for approval of the agenda. So move moved. that we approve the agenda. Okay, moved by Trustee uh, Jones, seconded by Trustee Jimenez. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The uh, any abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Now we'll move on to the consent agenda. Uh, these will be acted on by one motion unless there's a request to pull anything for discussion. Is there a request to pull anything for discussion? Not for me. I'm okay. Okay, nope. hearing no request, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll that make a motion to approve the consent, consent agenda. agenda. Okay, that's been moved by Trustee Jimenez, seconded by Trustee Jones. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Attentions? Okay, the consent agenda is passed unanimously. The first item is a contract between France Law Group and the Central Union High School District to provide services for a claim against fuel and electronic cigarettes. Is there any discussion? If there's no discussion at this time, I'd like to make a motion 
Um, I would move approval of the agreement with the following changes, specifically that from section five and anywhere else for the sake of clarity, that it would clarify that any award of attorney's fees by the court would be deducted from our obligation to pay the attorneys. Second, in section five entitled fees and elsewhere if appropriate, that we would be uh, charged and would pay no fees on any non-monetary award of damages. And find the final uh, change I would suggest is section nine, arbitration. I would suggest that uh, attorney malpractice be specifically excluded <clears throat> from the arbitration and or mediation clause. I'll second that motion. Okay, it's been moved by myself seconded by trustee walker uh, if there's no further discussion i'll call for the question all those in favor please signify by saying aye 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 opposed abstentions the motion carries unanimously mr childers uh i know that um it's i'm grateful to have two attorneys on the call especially when working with attorneys or on the board uh, so if you'll make sure you highlight those document those those changes so that Miss uh, Taylor and I can work with the France Law Group to get that contracted amended correctly. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to approval of the personnel report. Is there a motion? I make a motion to approve the personnel report. Second. I'll second it. Okay, uh, it's been moved by Trustee Jones, seconded by Trustee Jimenez. Approval of the personnel report. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The motion carries unanimously. Moving on to action item number three, public notice and approval of intent to employ certificated applicants under the CBEST single subject waiver. I'll make a motion to approve the uh, <clears throat> employees under the CBEST waiver. Second. Okay, it's been moved by Trustee Jones, seconded by Trustee Walker. Uh, absent a request for discussion, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Action item number four, a motion to approve hourly pay for certificated teaching staff for the 2021 school year. So move. I'll second it. Second. Okay, it's been moved by Trustee Walker, seconded by Trustee Jimenez. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Opposed? Abstentions? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. <laughs> Action item number five, variable term waiver request. A waiver of certificated, or rather a waiver of certificate of completion of staff development to provide instruction to English language learners. Is there a I motion? I'll approve item, item five on the agenda. I'll second. Okay, it's been, uh, there's been a motion by Trustee Menes, second by Trustee Walker. Um, no, it's just Trusty Jones. Trusty Jones, I'm sorry. With these That's pictures. That's okay, we look alike. We do look alike. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, if there's no need for discussion, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing no opposition, any abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. All right, now we move on to approval of the job description for Assistant Superintendent for Educational Services. Uh, I think you missed seven, right? I guess we haven't got there yet. Uh, you're I'm on six. And if I may, this is you're, you're on six for I'm the assistant six. superintendent. Um, I can go ahead and make the motion, or someone else would entertain the motion. My my one required change would be that uh, under the required credentials, education, and experience, that we have a required qualification of a minimum of uh, three years in classroom teaching experience. So I'll go ahead and make that motion. I'll second it, Ryan. Okay. So the motion's been made, seconded by Trustee Amendment. Is there any discussion? Is that at the high school level, Ryan? Um, my motion wasn't to make a distinction. I know there are some items in the job description that, that want high school level work. Uh, so I think that in combination is probably not necessary, but. Okay, good. Thank you. Any other discussion? No. All right, then I'll call for the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 
Extensions, can the motion carries unanimously with the amendment to the document. All right. All right, approval of proposed job description for educational services fiscal technician. I move that we approve item seven on the action agenda. Okay. I'll second that. Okay, moved by Trustee Menez, seconded by Trustee Jones. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Action item number eight, public disclosure of the initial contract proposal from the Classified School Employees Association for the 2019 school year negotiations. I bow to Mrs. Uh, Garcia. Um, well, this is just for, this is just disclosure. Uh, my recollection is uh, then we turn around. Well, so that's on the classified. So I don't, there's really nothing for us to do. My re is my recollection. No. Right. Okay. In fact, it's just we're receiving it. Um, it's just their disclosure. I don't know. If, I don't think there's any action associated. No. With it. Okay. Uh, if okay. I may, it's just sunshining. It's sunshining their proposal. Right. Okay. So then we'll move on to the public hearing under item number nine on the fiscal impact of the 1920 uh, tentative agreement with the Central Union High School District um, and the El Centro Secondary Teachers Association. So at this time, I'll open the public hearing. I'll ask IT staff if we have any requests for comment at the public hearing. Uh, yes, I believe uh, Gabino Duenas would like to make some ECST uh, comments. Certainly, Mr. Duenas, are you available? I'm promoting him right now. Thank you. Hi, uh, I intended my comments to be for the end of the meeting. I had no comments at this point. Okay, well then we'll reserve, uh, reserve you for your usual place, Mr. Duenas, thank you. All right, um, since there were no, none others mentioned for the public hearing, uh, unless someone interjects, I'll close the public hearing and we'll move on to approval of the tentative agreement between uh, the Board of Trustees and the ECSTA. Is there a motion? I move. Okay, thank you, Trustee Garcia Ruiz. There's a second. I'll second it. Okay, second by Trustee Jimenez. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposition or abstentions? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. And uh, thank you to both sides who worked so hard to make that happen. All right, moving on to number 11, the memorandum of understanding between the ICOE and uh, Central Union High School District regarding speech language pathology consulting services. Move the approval. Okay. Second. Okay, it's been moved by Trustee Walker, uh, seconded by Trustee Jimenez. Dr. Andrus, I think the document speaks for itself, but if you feel the need to uh, interject, please feel free. Otherwise, I'll call for the question. Uh, just briefly, what we've experienced over the past uh, school year is a pretty sharp increase of number of students needing speech language services. Uh, we went from a dozen or so to nearly two dozen students needing services. During the COVID closures, actually, uh, it became quite apparent that we need additional support. So we contracted with an outside vendor to provide those services online. It's more expensive to do that than to share a person with the county office of ed, which they were employing someone. So uh, we're adding in some services by way of this contract, and then we'll, we'll eliminate the, the need with the online service. However, the online service was great. We had good reviews. The families enjoyed working with their speech language uh, pathologist um, online uh, because of the nature of what they do and uh, worked well. So this is just replacing that service. Okay. We've uh, already had a motion and a second. So with that, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed or abstentions? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. All right, item action item number 12, a request for the Board of Trustees approval of the service agreement uh, with the LLC doing business as Decision Insight for district demographic analysis and enrollment projections. Move the approval of the agreement with who knew it, because I like saying that word. <laughs> who knew it? <laughs> who knew it? I'll second it. I'll second the motion. Okay, uh, motion by Trustee Walker, second by Trustee Jones. 
Uh, Dr. Andrus, is there any uh, presentation or comment on this? No, not on this one, other than the fact that we use them for enrollment projections, um, helps us track number of students that are coming in and shows us the trend lines from our feeder patterns as well. Very helpful, okay. So with that then, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed or abstentions? Okay, hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. All right, uh, action item number 13, approval of the 2021 school plan for student achievement for Central Southwest and Desert Oasis High Schools. I move that we approve item 13 on the action uh, item uh, on the agenda, 13. Okay, is there a second? I'll second to approve the 2021 school plan for student achievement for Central Southwest and Desert Oasis. Okay, there's been a motion and second. Dr. Anders, will there be any uh, staff presentation on this or just approve? No, it's just approved. These are links. Uh, there's even though it's we in this board, we tend to breeze by this, but there's countless hours of work that goes into both planning, documenting and executing what these plans are. They really represent the core work that our school sites do. Um, the all of the additional programs, the nuances about instruction, when we adopt a piece of curriculum or a program, um, all of those things are articulated in there. Um, at the high school level, these are also usually aligned with their WASC action accreditation plans, uh, which I was noting that actually this next school year during 2021, all of our schools are doing mid-year visits of some kind. So th these plans also sync up to help with our accreditation process. They're very important to us and they um, align with uh, LCAP projects and so forth. So uh, this is kind of a summary piece, um, very important that we do, and it helps provide guidance and structure to our schools. Thank you. All right, with the motion and second, uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed abstentions? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Move on to action item number 14, adoption of the CUHSD COVID-19 operations LCAP written report. I move that we adopt uh... CUHD COVID-19 operations LCAP written report. Okay, is there a second? I'll second the motion to adopt the CUHSD COVID-19 operation LCAP written report. Okay, a motion by Trustee Menes, second by Trustee Jones. Dr. Andrews, is there uh, staff? Yeah. Right, let me just provide a brief comment. Um, with the COVID-19 emergency executive orders and the LCAP plans, it was recognized by the state that schools will not be able to plan, develop the plans as they normally do. Uh, we weren't able to gather stakeholders the same way and get the same type of community input. So they required that we complete a very brief report on our activities and, and plans going forward. And then a full plan would be developed and approved no later than December 15, 2020. So what you see before you in this item is actually just a summary report of our activities and next step plans. Um, Ms. Hart is the one, Ms. Hart is the one who compiled this for us. And again, tremendous amount of work that went into the planning and execution of this. This is this represents $10 million worth of efforts that our teachers and staff members contribute to services for our students and children. And we're very delighted for the, the outcomes that are coming from this. But this is just a summary report. Um, and does not require the same procedures have we've had a public hearing in the past. Those things will all be pushed off to the fall. So we look forward to seeing more information later in uh, November and approved no later than December 15th. Okay, thank you. All right, so it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. All those opposed or abstaining? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. And we will move on to item 15, a request that the Board of Trustees approve the license agreement between CUHSD and Benabody Farms, LLC. Move the approval. Second. Okay, it's been uh, moved by Trustee Walker, seconded by Trustee Jimenez. Again, the documents, I believe, speaks for itself. I spoke to some knowledgeable people in the farm community, and this does appear to be at a market rent for property um, and also it's a license agreement which means that if we needed the property in short order we would be able to do so um, so is there any other discussion no i'm good okay hearing none i'll call for the question all those in favor please signify by saying aye aye, aye. opposed abstaining hearing no opposition or abstentions the motion passes unanimously 
move on to action item number 16, a memorandum of understanding between IVROP and the Central Union High School District for the 2021 school year. I move that we accept the memorandum of understanding between the Imperial Valley Regional Occupational Program and the Central Union High School District for the 2021 school year. Okay. I'll second the motion. It's been moved by Trustee Jimenez, seconded by Trustee Jones. Is there any discussion or comment? Okay, hearing none, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed or abstaining? Hearing none again, the motion passes unanimously. We'll move on to action item number 17. Uh, request the board approve the bids for re-roofing of uh, certain buildings at of the Central Union High School District. I move to approve the bids for the re-roofing of Central Union High School District buildings. Uh, and just to clarify, or, or is your motion in line with the action required Namely, that uh, we approve base bid one and base bid four from CNI Roofing. Yes, that's correct. Okay, with that clarification, is there a second? Second. All right. Um, I don't know if, uh, okay, uh, Mr. President. Just a brief comment um, on this. So, we have multiple roofs that need to be repaired and we prioritize them every year, which is the most in need. Um, and there was the, the, the highest needs actually are the Southwest High School Library and the Central Union High School admin buildings. So this covers those primarily um, uh, to get those taken care of at this point in time. There are a few more roofs down the road, but they're just, they'll have to wait a little longer. We'll get by until we have additional funds to do that deferred maintenance. And uh, if I may, the, the funds for this were funds that had previously been set aside before we knew that we had a, a COVID-19 recession. Correct. Correct. Problem on the horizon. So these Correct. monies already set aside will not impact the COVID impacted budgets. Correct. This is money that we'd already set aside for deferred maintenance. And in order to keep that deferred maintenance going, the, the funds that come, uh, we have to continue services. So uh, we'd already budgeted for this and we've scaled back the needs uh, that we have uh, to accommodate the limited budget that we have. All right, unless there's any further comment, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed or abstaining? Opposition or abstention? The motion passes unanimously. And we will move on to action item number 18, the request for board approval of the resolution ending in 27 regarded, regarding no competitive advantage finding uh, for the clock and public address system and upgrade project at Southwest High School. Uh, I move the approval of resolution number uh, ending in 27. Second. It's been moved by Trustee Walker, seconded by Trustee Jimenez. Um, is there, this, this is out of the norm, so I suspect Dr. Andrews, either you or Arnold will. Yeah, let, let me, this is a little out of the norm. Normally we'd bring forward a contract for approval. However, at the time of the bids, there were no bids that came in at this time. So this resolution allows us to go out and uh, uh, work directly with a couple of different vendors to get pricing on this project. Um, it does say clock and public address system, but it's actually much, much more. Um, this project will actually solve quite a few issues that we experienced at Southwest High School. Over the years, and when Southwest was originally built, we didn't have all the appropriate infrastructure that we need now, like it's going in the STEM building in terms of network capacity. So over the years, we, the, the staff has kind of patched things together. Some of our internet distribution hardware, that gear is actually sitting in um, equipment rooms where there's electrical equipment. And so it's not air conditioned space to keep it operating at max at best capacity. Also this, this gear that we need to update is um, quite old. So by completing this project in the, in the course of this next uh, summer, summer months, and probably completing it in the early fall, we would increase the dish, the school's capacity with its network capabilities. One of the challenges we experience at Southwest is the many challenges we hear about the Wi-Fi or the slow network. Um, when using the system there. Much of this will upgrade all of that hardware and then really what uh, the, the clocks and the PA system are attached to it. Um, so even though it, it does say clock and public address system, the backbone is really what we're upgrading. That's the most expensive parts. And we'd add some exterior speakers, we'd upgrade the switch gear and the hardware in the infrastructure. There would be new clocks and, and speakers in all the classrooms. And that's been part of our safety concerns is that the 
with the, the failing equipment in the classrooms, both the PA systems, the speakers, and all of that connective material, is that's beginning to fail. It's all analog, older system. And so we get muffled messages, incomplete messages. Some rooms get signal, some do not. And it's been a problem that we've been uh, chasing throughout the fall. Uh, and so we decided this is actually not just a network convenience issue, it's also a safety issue to have a very high functioning uh, public address system throughout the school. The school. Uh, and so it may, when the final cost comes in, the contract comes in and it's, it's um, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, it's not just for the clocks and the PAs. It, it's not speakers and clocks. The real expense is relocating and putting in the appropriate network equipment throughout that school so that all of those devices will work correctly and that we'll have other benefits such as the network working better. So that's a little bit more about the project. And Dr. Anders, if I may, it, it's not clear to me from the wording of the resolution whether or not uh, when a decision is made and a contract is negotiated, whether or not that would come back to the board. Section two of the resolution seems to indicate it would not but it's not entirely clear. So I'd like to clarify that. So the intention at this point in time is to get us under contract as quickly as possible so that we can proceed. Um, if we were to work, work it out and then bring the contract back in August, we can do that if the board chooses to do that. Um, uh, but it, it just delays the work, you know, that many more weeks. So the, the resolution allows us to enter into contract uh, without the board having to, to go through the final approval process. And, and I'm okay with that. I understand a motion's already been made, but if we're gonna do that, I, I, I don't wanna put Arnold on the spot, but is there a, a, do, a not to exceed number that you guys could give us based on our budget for this item so that we don't, I, I know you guys wouldn't do this, but that we don't come back and find out, oh my gosh, we spent $700,000 on something we thought was going to be two or three. Um, I think it's, you know, our responsibility to make sure that we at least know a worst case scenario. Sure. So uh, Mr. Preciado, if you want to join us here um, in a minute, let me make a quick comment. We had estimated this package to be between three to $350,000 um, to do all of this work. Um, that's, that's the complete process. Um, we worked with Mr. Sanders. Um, the, the one bid that we, 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 not a bid, but we went out again after the bids didn't come through. We went out and contacted a, a local vendor who we've worked with in the past, and they gave us a, a bid that's in the $400,000 price range. Um, and so we are not comfortable with that number. So we're going to contact another vendor or two and see how competitive that is and ask them to bid this package as well. Um, one of the other companies that potentially may operate or take to pick this up is the same company doing the work in the STEM building. So we're going to reach out to that contractor and see if they have any interest. Um, but I don't believe um, we recognize we do have a limit in that budget um, in our deferred maintenance budget, and we won't <coughs> exceed that. We simply won't. Um, so that's uh, that is, that's the part of reassurance you're asking about. Like you had mentioned that you know that we wouldn't put us in danger. But um, in terms of a, a limit, Mr. Preciado, do you want to make a comment on that? Uh, sure. Thank you, Dr. Andrus. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, very good. Thank you. Yes. Um, so the board just made a motion uh, with the previous item and approved the previous for the two roofs. That's going to come out of fund uh, 140, which is deferred maintenance funds. And again, we have a limited amount of dollars that are in there to do these projects. Um, what I have anticipated is that a project like this and this PA and, and with the proposal that was provided um, actually is a little bit closer to around 500,000. Uh, so given that we've just approved 300,000 for the roofs, this project might come in closer to about 500,000. That is pretty much gonna wipe out that deferred maintenance fund for these two projects. It might leave us approximately 40 to $50,000 for, for HVAC replacements in the future. We made HVAC replacements already. Uh, we're gonna have to continue that as we move forward, but that pretty much uh, is going to take care of the funds that we have in Fund 140. As we move forward into the future, obviously we're gonna to try to address priority items and needs. Um, we'll see how we, we do with that uh, in terms of funding from the state and other areas uh, of, of the district's financials, but um, at this point in time, that would probably, these two projects, the, the, the PA clock uh, uh, address system and the roofs would pretty much uh, take care of everything that's in one Fund 140. Ms. Preciado, if I may, 
I have two questions. The first, I, I'm confident I know the answer to, but for the benefit of the public, the monies that would be used to pay for this uh, PA system and the other uh, tech infrastructure improvements, those are monies that have previously been aside, set aside in previous year's budgets and would not be coming out of any budget year impacted by COVID-19, correct? The, 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 the two projects that we just discussed, the answer is yes. Uh, it, it will not come out from any other funds. We're trying to limit these, the cost of these projects to come out of deferred maintenance, which the money has already been set aside in deferred maintenance fund. And then my second question is, provided that the maker of the motion, Mr. Walker, is willing to do so, would you be comfortable with a, a not to exceed number of 500,000 uh, on this uh, uh, resolution and authorization? Steve? Uh, no, actually, I, I was asking- uh, I think that's for Arnold, right? Press the auto first. Um, I'm sorry, I, 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 I wasn't uh, following you. I thought you were asking Mr. Walker uh, to revise his- uh, That's okay. No, I was asking, provided Mr. Walker is willing to go along with my suggestion, I, would you and the rest of staff be comfortable with a not to exceed number of $500,000? I, I would be comfortable. Uh, Mr. Walker, as a professional courtesy, would you be willing to amend your motion as such? Consider it amended. All right, and Mr. Menez- Second, the amended motion, all right. Are there any further questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, please signify. Resolution. Uh, thank you very much, yes. Roll call vote, please. Trustee Garcia Reese. Yes. Trustee Jones. Yes. Trustee Childers. Yes. Trustee Jimenez. Yes. Trustee Walker. Yes. All right, thank you. We'll move on to action item number 19, a public hearing for the Central Union High School District adopted, adopted budget. I know that we had a special meeting where a presentation was given on the budget. Is there <coughs> gonna be any kind of presentation uh, either prior to or after this hearing? Uh, at yeah. some point, yeah, whenever you would like to fit that in, there is a, uh, a condensed version with updated information. Well, before I open the public hearing then so that the public will be able to comment on the substance of the presentation. Uh, Mr. Preciado, if you're ready at this time, I yield the floor for your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Childers. Let me go ahead and share my screen. <clears throat> Can everybody see the screen? Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to get the video. Oh, oh okay. Um, I'm trying to get the video off to the right hand side to do, to uh, to uh, one second, please. Um, I I'm trying to because I had the video off to the side, we, I can't see the full screen. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, tonight's uh, presentation is again, as uh, Mr. Childers has already mentioned, we had a, a board workshop, board budget workshop on June 9th to provide information regarding the updated uh, or upcoming budget for July 1st. Uh, as we all know, this uh, pandemic has caused uh, impacts uh, in various forms and levels. Uh, one of them being of greatest concern at this moment is the impact to the state revenue. And so for tonight, we're gonna revisit some of the slides that I presented back on June 9th that have to deal with uh, very quickly here with the California's economy, uh, impact of the state revenues due to the shift of the income tax deadline from April 15th to July 15th, uh, rainy day fund and budget stabilization and what uh, is being planned for that. And then the governor's may revise regarding cash deferrals, the COLA, and the impact to the Central Union High School District regarding the cuts and estimated actuals uh, and what that impact will have on estimated actuals in our July 1 budget. I, I do wanna specify and uh, uh, inform the board that uh, 
as of yesterday, Monday, and early uh, today, Tuesday, we have been receiving information that yes, there is an agreement between the governor and the legislature on a budget for 2021. Uh, I will be mentioning some of the uh, agreed upon items, although we don't have all the details at this point in time, but I'll, I'll be mentioning some of the agreed upon items as we move forward through this slideshow, uh, because this slideshow and our budget is based on the governor's May revise. So um, there's going to be revisions and a lot of revisions to our budget, especially after July 15th, once we know from the state uh, side of the revenue, that what the state is anticipated in terms of uh, income tax revenue. I'll move on to slide number two. So we know that the pandemic has hit our nation uh, very, very hard in terms of its economy, which of course, California also takes a hit uh, because I'm, of that. I'm, I'm not seeing the slides right now. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, no slides? I'm not. Everybody else got them? I can see them. <clears throat> okay, I've got, I've got it. Uh, I'm sorry. I've got it. Okay. So um, um, slide number two, it just again, we know that uh, when a nation goes down in terms of the economy and there's a downturn to the economy, the state of California also has an impact uh, regarding that. And, um, and we usually take it hardest. And when the economy turns around, the California is usually one of the first states to come out of it, along with the nation trying to uh, uh, come after that. But we are in a pandemic and we are having huge economic financial impacts to the state of California. Last time I mentioned also that the shift between the income tax deadline from April 15th to July 15th has caused a major rift in the state receiving its personal income tax. As you can see here in 1819, we had anticipated a little over $60 billion in income tax, and it actually came in more like 75 billion, a 22.9% increase in, uh, in personal income taxes for that particular year. Uh, in 2019, we had anticipated again over a little over 60, and the uh, personal income tax actually came in at 31.2% higher, or over $80 billion in state tax collection revenue. And in this year, 2020, uh, we have only received 7.6% over what we had anticipated uh, receiving, and so that's just a little over $70 billion. So we are we, we are having a, a major impact, the state is having a major impact by shifting these dollars uh, from April 15th to July 15th. And we know, and the state has also mentioned that there will probably be a budget adjustment on the state side will also, that will also have an impact to the Central Union High School District budget come September. And we'll be making these adjustments uh, once uh, we know what the adjustments are for the agreed upon budget between the legislature and the governor, and we'll be making those adjustments in September. So we know that the governor has a, a projected a $54 billion hole, and he's planning on using approximately half of the um, rainy day budget stabilization account in this upcoming year. He's got to fill in this $54 billion hole, and he's going to use 7.8 part of the budget stabilization account or $7.8 billion to help with filling up that hole. We know that up until this time, there was not a lot of information that was provided out of the May revise. Um, we know that there is a, a, a huge unemployment rate uh, increase. We know that the personal income tax revenue, which is the state's largest share of, of general fund revenue has been deferred. We have, and we know that consumer confidence has been shaken up, uh, so people aren't spending money. Uh, and we know that large and small businesses are being hit hard with this COVID-19. So we'll see what happens come July 15th, and hopefully there's better news then. Go ahead. Um, the deferrals um, are coming back. Uh, most of you, uh, uh, I re remember that uh, in the Great Recession, it was huge amounts of these dollar bags uh, moving from one fiscal year to the next, from one month within the fiscal year to 
several months down the road. And what that essentially means is that, uh, and I'll put it in this in simple terms, um, this just means that here for the, for the school district in June, our paycheck of $1.9 billion to schools, uh, we're not gonna receive that $1.9 billion paycheck in June, we're gonna receive it in July. So that means that we school districts will need to come up with our cash, our own cash from our reserves to cover our obligations and our operational costs in the district. That's gonna happen again in fiscal year 2021 as well. And let me show you a graph here on the next slide, which shows this $1.87 billion deferral or paycheck, as I just mentioned, from June to July of next year. So we're gonna do without a paycheck in one month. The proposal at the end of 2021 is to continue this deferral and the governors may revise that 5.28 billion. Well, under this agreement, the 1.87 continues, but this is this grows up to 5.9 billion dollars. And if, I'm sorry, I take that back to 3.7 billion dollars. I'm sorry, 3.3.4 billion dollars. I'm sorry, I'm looking at numbers here. 3.4 billion dollars. So that's what. The, the agreement between the governor and the legisl legislature was is $3.4 billion here. But if the federal government does not provide us with additional funds to help school districts and to help to bail the district uh, the state out, then there's a trigger to add an additional $5.7 billion to the end of this fiscal year. Now, what does that mean for the district? That means for the month of February, our allocation in February will be reduced by 65%. We will lose March, April, May, and June apportionment. That means we will not get a paycheck for all of these years. And the Central Union High School Districts, along with the other school districts in the state, we'll have to come up with five months worth of cash. That is a huge deferral. So the state government at this point in time is putting a lot of faith in the federal government coming up with additional bailout money. That's very, very concerning. So, so the, the agreement was not to make cuts, but to defer cash. Well, when you don't have cash, you still need to make cuts so that you can meet your, your cash uh, levels and you can still meet your obligations. I wanna make that very clear. So this is a slide that I showed the board at, at, in the workshop on June 9th. We were to receive our, uh, this fiscal year $49.2 million as our LCFF, which $3.3 million is going to be deferred, but we still book $49.2 million as the revenues for on our balance sheet. We were looking at a close to 10% cut in 2021, but that's now gone away. So we're going to look at something similar to this $49.2 million or close to it in this fiscal year, but we're not going to receive uh, approximately at this point in time, $6 million of the cash associated with the LCFF. We're six minutes short. Okay. Now we know that the federal government has given the state uh, CARES Act dollars. We know that we're to receive uh, approximately 921 of that ESSER part of the CARES Act. And we're, uh, we don't have the information from the agreement, but the, the governor and the legislature is gonna provide additional federal funds that have been provided to the state to school districts based on supplemental concentration. 
I don't know what that looks like at this time. But this is what we know and we have in the budget at this time. We know that we our stores and purse rate cost increases over time, and that's not going to change. And we should see an increase in 2021 uh, based on salary increases and because PERS increase rate. We know that we have uh, compensation uh, costs uh, associated with a tentative agreement that was just approved. In 1920, we uh, uh, have budgeted for $931,000 for this fiscal year. And then for 2021, we budgeted $806,000 based on the tentative agreement that was just approved by the board. I want to make this very clear. We have no other uh, uh, agreement uh, or we don't have an agreement with classified the school employees association or uh, other groups. We, we don't have any compensation in the 1920 or in this case, now that we're completed 1920 in 2021 budget. So there are no other compensation increases for other groups in 2021 at this time. Oh. I also showed uh, at our budget uh, workshop, the cuts that we've made in various departments and programs also showed the board that we've made adjustments and cuts to school site budgets and athletic budgets. And so let me show the now the 1920 estimated actuals and the 2021 budget. So for 1920, we are showing an $830,000 deficit before transfers out. These dollars have been transferred out. Uh, we have always uh, talked about that three million of this of these dollars have been transferred to Fund 400 to help with cash flow and the completion of STEM building, and then also anticipated the building of the aquatic center. Uh, $685,000 of this remaining amount goes to fund 140 for uh, defer, uh, deferred maintenance, and the rest goes to the cafeteria account to support the cafeteria. For 2021, we're showing that $347,000 to the good after we've made approximately $4 million in cuts coming from all, of course, the reduction in revenues, we have to make reductions in expenditures. We've also greatly reduced the transfers out from 3.8 million to $200,000. This $200,000 consists of $160,000 to the cafeteria fund to continue supporting the cafeteria fund and the program and only 40,000 to the deferred maintenance fund is that it is a requirement that we continue a cash flow amount into that fund to keep it open. So we're simply transferring 40,000 into deferred maintenance. Again, the 40,000 to assist and help with HVAC, uh, other uh, fencing, uh, facility improvements, whatever we need to do, but it's gonna be a minimal is in 2021. Any questions so far? The next slide shows us here uh, again, after the transfers out in 1920, we're showing a $4.7 million deficit. That 4.7 coming out of a close to $13 million ending fund balance or beginning fund balance leaves us $8.3 million. Of the 8.3, we have revolving cash, we have stores, which is inventory and $1 million in restricted dollars here for a total uh, ending fund balance of approximately 7.1 million. That's these two numbers put together. Now, why did I break this out? Was well, because this $3.3 million here 
represents our P2 June deferral. And if ever those deferrals just all of a sudden disappear, if the state says, you know, we don't have the cash to pay you for whatever reason, this is where it's going to disappear at. This is where it's going to come from. It's basically going to take half of our ending fund balance for reserves. So these two numbers put together gives us 11.27% reserve. It doesn't mean cash, folks. That just means reserve on our budget financial documents. For 2021, we end the year, or, or we're projecting to end the year with 147,000 to the good. That's added to the $8.3 million here which now gives us $8.4 million as an ending fund balance projected for 2021. There's approximately $2 million here in uh, restricted funds. We'll, oh, sorry. And then the reason why is because again, we're receiving funds from the federal government. Uh, we're looking at maybe that 931,000 to be stretched out. We don't know what that's going to look like, but they are restricted funds. But this is what it looks like. Our ending fund balance is going to be basically uh, the same for our P2 deferral, but this decreases slightly to $3 million or $2.9 million, which gives us an 11.17% ending fund balance in 2021. At this point in time, I'm, I, I am cautiously optimistic. Uh, and I'm providing the board uh, for their consideration to approve what to me looks like a very close to a balanced budget. Uh, we certainly don't know what is in store for us after July 15. The, the, the state is betting on the federal government bailing us out. Uh, and of course the federal government or federal budget uh, comes due on August 1st. So we'll certainly see what the federal government has in store for us prior to October 1st. So a lot of what ifs, um, but certainly a much better position than what I provided to the board back on June 9th. Um, and we're gonna continue to move forward with a very, very tight budget. Um, I've been uh, advising my staff the departments that we're going to have to live within our means. Uh, we are certainly tightening our belts in order to make our budget and our district uh, uh, keep afloat. And also to have the cash balance necessary to pay for our operational expenses. Any questions? Can you hear me, uh, Arnold? Yes, I can. Uh, you you mentioned on the 29th <laughs> 2020 uh, estimated actuals, you said the P2 June deferral, if that's not met, that's gonna uh, cut our res restricted reserve, unrestricted reserve by half, right? Right? If at any point in time, the state has said that they are gonna make it good, but uh, you, ne you never know if the state sure. comes, comes back uh, in July and says, we don't have the cash, the federal government says, nope, um, the HEROES Act is dead on arrival, no negotiations. We don't know what that impact is. I'm sim simply identifying what that would mean if okay. the revenues were to disappear in this uh, amount. Now that would mean that that reasoning would also stand good for the 2021 budget of three, three million right there, correct. If that doesn't come in, that, the same goes for the unrestricted reserve it's cut in half also. Yeah. So okay. this is just this, just a P2 June deferral. Sure. And, sure, what, sure. and under the agreement between the governor and the legislature, um, they are planning at, at this point in time, if the federal government doesn't provide us with additional funds, they're planning on deferring March, April, May, and June. Part of February, all of March, April, May, and June, uh, uh, allocations to the district. That is a lot of cash. That is upwards of $13 million for our district. Question. Uh, do you happen to know what 
what the reserve is for the for the state have they are they going to uh tap into their reserve also because they had a healthy reserve before COVID-19 is yeah, that tapping is, into that? They're, they're going to take approximately half of that stabilization uh, uh, account okay. and they can only take approximately half because by legislation under prop two they can only take half uh, at any one point uh, in time in any one year they can only take half of that so that's where that 7.8 billion comes in okay thank you yes uh mr preciado if i may can you hear me yes sir uh, okay, just to, just to be clear for the purposes of the public, uh, when you said it earlier, you you said something along the lines of a nearly of a nearly balanced budget or something like that. But if I'm reading the twenty twenty one budget numbers correctly, we're actually uh, spending approximately one hundred and fifty thousand less than we're taking in. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, we're we're spending one hundred and fifty thousand less than we're taking in. Yes. Okay, so we're balanced to the good. Yes, sir. All right, and then with respect to the the P two uh, June deferral, um, and and Mr. Jimenez's question about that possibly wiping out half of our reserve, um, isn't it correct that deferrals were rampant during the uh, Great Recession, and uh, the state made up all those deferrals to us and and never never missed one, correct? Uh, yes, but that came about as uh, I also want to mention that Great Recession took a long time, or it took us a long time to get out of that Great Recession. I think that was an eight, nine year uh, uh, stint of that Great Recession. So we had many, many years of deferrals and they grew over time. Uh, and some of the deferrals that when, when we were anticipated receiving, we did not receive the state pushed those out a few more months but yes they came back and they paid us back all of that come the lcff started in 13 14. and, and the reason i asked that question is just because you know in, in this really unprecedented time in terms of health and budgets uh, you know i think people are paying closer attention and i, I just want to make it clear that when we see that number and it could half our reserves the decisions there that we're making with respect to the budget we're passing is all within the, the historical context of the fact that a payment of that type has never been missed. Could it happen? Do we need to know that it could happen and what the impacts would be? Yes, but we're not out rolling the dice either. We know that it, uh, to a high degree of probability that at some point that money will come in. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, that That's all, all I have in, um, in light of this presentation and the the more in-depth one we got before, I'm glad that unexpectedly that any news is better than we'd anticipated is is a, a small miracle. So um, are there any other comments or questions from other board members? I have a couple of questions. Please. Uh, what are we gonna have to do to make sure our students have uh, materials for online? So let me speak to that um, that question, Ms. Jones. A good question. Uh, the, we, we do have adequate resources at the moment for the number of devices that are needed to issue to students. Uh, we, have, we have enough. Uh, actually, we just received another 100 MiFi devices to connect to the internet, and we didn't even deploy all the ones that we had. Um, okay, good. In the next presentation, I'll share with you some parent survey data around the number of devices that families have in internet connections. So we think that... Um, and over the course of the next little while, we will we are going to move to a one-to-one -one initiative where we are going to work on a plan to issue a Chromebook to students as their own, um, even when they come on campus. We'll still need to maintain a few uh, carts of computers for testing purposes, but we do want to get to the point where when a freshman comes in, they have a device, they keep it for four years, it's theirs. If it gets broken, they can replace it through an insurance program. Uh, when they graduate, they can you know, buy it for 20 bucks or something like that or return it. And because um, by then it'll be done. <laughs> but but we do yeah. need to get to the point where they've got a device. And so we have a, currently enough devices to hand out to all those who need it. We don't have enough devices just to issue one to every student regardless of need, but, um, but we do have enough right now for those who are asking for them. 
Okay. Okay, any further comments or questions? All right, well, hearing none, then uh, at this time, I will now formally open the public hearing under action item number 19. I'll ask the IT staff if we have any uh, members of the public that wish to participate in the public hearing on the on the uh, budget. We do not have anybody requesting to participate. Okay. Then I will uh, close the public hearing at this time. And <coughs> on to the approval of the 1920 estimated actuals and the 2021 proposed adopted budget. I'll make the motion to approve the uh, estimated actuals uh, for our budget for 2021. Okay. I'll second it. Was that uh, Mr. Jimenez? Yes. Okay. So we've got a motion from Trustee Jones, second from Trustee Jimenez. Uh, we've already had a public hearing, so unless somebody speaks up and says they want to discuss it further, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> All right. Uh, opposition or abstentions? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. And now we're on to informational items. Dr. Andrus, I understand uh, you're going to talk to us a little bit about uh, what the fall may look like. And Dr. Andrus, you're you. muted. Yeah, Got okay. it. Gosh, it's still always, a, you have to remember to do that. Uh, so let me share my screen. I've got a presentation. It's really uh, somewhat of an update from where we were last month in May. Um, in May, we had a lot of questions and not a lot of answers. The, the state hadn't provided their guidance documents. We had, and there had been lots of planning and discussion, but we, but folks were still dealing with more questions than answers. Um, we feel now that we have more answers. Um, there's still um, a need to modify as we go, and I'll talk about flexibility during the course of this. Um, even as recently as this week, when the governor decided to issue the uh, face mask. Uh, in public uh, executive order that may have implications on what our current plans are here and what you may see in this presentation. Um, along those lines, we're in regular communication with the, the county health department. As a matter of fact, tomorrow morning, they will join our uh, superintendents, uh, county superintendents meeting, which we meet now every week uh, to discuss um, the implications of that. So uh, we'll jump into this. We, we, the first thing we did is we started asking our parents, what, what are your thoughts? What is it that you're thinking? What are you concerned about? So we sent out a survey in the middle of May. It, it came in and completed at the end of the month of the May. And we've compiled them. I'm going to share those results here in just a minute. But we had responses, about 1,200 responses from our in, of the English language survey and nearly 300 responses of the same survey, but in Spanish. So we had a, a pretty significant response. This is close to about 30% response rate. Uh, between their total number of families who are who are who are our students, so we we had a distribution of who was like where are my students at, and you can see it was a, a few more Southwest parents responded than Central parents, but we did get a mix of of, of uh, families who were responding. Um, this is the English response rate. This is not include the Spanish one. Um, actually, the Spanish rate was very high from Southwest High School. So again, um, where will my students be? Uh, even when we included the Spanish ones, when I looked at that briefly, it's about the same, pretty well distributed across the grade levels. Um, we could see that, that everyone was pretty well distributed um, who was responding. So what are people asking for? So we had a, venari a, a set of scenarios of asking them, what, what do you, you know, if this is the scenario, what would you do? So we said if schools are permitted to open on a block or some sort of modified schedule like morning or afternoons with limitations like masks, would you send your child to school? And 60, 70% of the family said yes, as long as it's permitted and we have the accommodations in place, they'd be willing to. But 30%, 31% said no. They're still not willing to sit, even with modifications and even though it being allowable, still not ready. Okay, next scenario. What if schools offer 100% distance learning online? Would you keep your child at home and continue distance learning? Um, actually, a lot of people are very interested in continuing the distance learning option. About 75% would be if that was the option, they'd like to do that. Um, and that would be to continue that. And some are like, no, I really need to send my child to school. They need to get to school. 
Another scenario we asked, what if schools are permitted to open on a traditional six period schedule, but with smaller class sizes and required physical distancing? Very similar to the other option of the block, block and modified schedules. And we had about the same result. If we're able to open and we follow all of the measures, about 60% are willing to say, yeah, I can send them to school, but a good portion, uh, the previous number was 30%, this is 37%, said, no, I, I don't want them. I still want my child to stay at home. And there's lots of reasons why parents are saying that. Um, they, the child themselves may be medically fragile. Um, the family may have someone in the family who's medically fragile. Um, there's that fear of, being, of contracting the disease. Uh, or, or it could be that the child has an extended family member who's, uh, let's say, an elderly person who lives in the home. So there's concerns about why we would, why we would send someone to school. Our last scenario is, well, what if we offer both? What if schools are permitted to open as usual with a six period schedule and no limitations, would you send your child to school? And, they, and most people said, no, we've got to have the, the limitations in there. We've really got to have those things in there uh, to make sure that our kids are safe. So just a handful would send them to school. So um, we asked about devices. Ms. Jones, this was your question. Does your student have his or her own individual device? And we're not talking about a cell phone, like a family shared device, but they have their own device. And you can, that they can use at home and at school, like bring it back and forth. And about 65% said, yes, we have, so people have it, but 40, 35% said no. So they don't have that, they would need a device. In our case, 40% would be somewhere in the neighborhood of um, around 1,800 to 2,000 um, students who would need a device. Uh, we asked about, uh, does your child, again, similar type question, do you need a Chromebook? Most people said no, about 40% said yes, kind of like the opposite here um, question. So yeah, we see about 40% of our students still need a device. We asked about internet connections. Do you have access to the internet? And as you can see, according to this survey result, again, these are survey takers online, 97% people said, yes, I've got access to the internet. This is, when we look at the poll, this may not be very accurate, but we recognize that most folks do have some sort of access to it. And we have the ability to connect families and individuals to Borderlink. Borderlink, if, if you or the public is not aware, Borderlink is a internet provider like Spectrum or AT&T that is uh, uh, provided through the County House of Education at no charge. And so families can use this when they have access issues and we can issue a device that helps them connect their Chromebook to it. So in summary, around 30% still want distance learning no matter what the conditions. They still really want distance learning. Most families are okay to send their, to school, their students to school when it's permissible and all the precautions are in place and we follow all the guidelines. But still there's a portion, they're like, no, we need distance learning full time. Most families have devices, but we need to provide them to somewhere between 40 and 50% of the students. We know that we're gonna have to provide devices and we're prepared to do that. Most families have access to the internet, but we need to provide them to probably we're estimating actually higher 20, 10 to 20% of our students are gonna need access to the internet. Even though that survey sure came up very high and when we provided devices before, not all of them were issued, but we are prepared to distribute up to a, uh, 200 different connections um, to help families get connected to the internet. So we feel we're, we're, some, we're mostly prepared uh, to, to do that. There's always a, an, a, a percent of uncertainty about what the actual demand will be, but we're pretty confident we're okay with devices. So we asked teachers very similar questions and the teacher survey followed right behind the parent survey and um, was completed. Uh, we made it available towards the end of the school year uh, to them. And so we asked the teachers, you know, distance learning model, if the school offers 100% distance learning model, are you supportive of this? And again, 75% of the response, 78%, 77% of the respondents were in favor. Yes, we like that. But a good 23% said, no, they really wanna see they're not supportive of that, mean they would want some sort of blended model where students are on campus. So there's good support for continuing distance learning, but there's plenty who want to see us get to a blended model and students returning um, when we're able to. Uh, next question, we asked about specifically a blended model. We said schools are permitted to open on a traditional six period schedule with groups attending one or two days a week, depending on how many we can have. These are smaller class sizes while following our district, county, and uh, guidelines. Uh, teachers, would you be supportive of helping those students around campus? And, and again, 65% of our teachers said, yes, we would be supportive of a blended model. 
Again, 35% said no. We don't know why they said no necessarily, but we do understand that most are in favor of this. And in their comments is, are there rationale for that? Next is a split model where we're doing both. And this means schools are, when schools are permitted to be open as usual on a tr six, traditional six period schedule with some students learning online and some students attending every day, a portion of students that are attending, attending every day, would you support this? Again, 60% said yes, we'd be okay with this model. And now a greater proportion, 37% said no. So again, these are just big charts of and summative type information. So, but in summary, most teachers wanna continue distance learning given our stage of recovery, recognizing that we're not really, we're not in a safe place yet to return. So we're gonna continue with distance learning. As conditions allow, most teachers do want to have some sort of blended learning model. Now, those that don't have different reasons for why they are not supportive of that, but most teachers still want to have a, dist a blended model. And most teachers agree we should offer options of both a distance learning and blended. So this helps us both with the parent requesting very similar outcomes. It helps us align these two different ideas. Uh, and we're gonna talk about those plans in a few moments. To help us shape what we're doing is there's been guidance issued from this organization first, from the California Department of Education. This is a cover page of their guidance. It's available online. And I'll show you where that information is found. But really the guidelines from the state were all very general guidelines, but no directives. We think the directives, we are gonna find those directives in the budget, budget bills that discuss how we're funded. We'll give a little more information around how to do distance learning. Uh, so the first bullet, we have to follow the local health official requirements. We have to practice physical distancing and all the precautions. We'll need to develop a distance learning plan as needed and then bring students back on campus as soon as it's practicable. As soon as we're able to bring students on campus, we need to bring students back. Uh, the state is also going to provide us a 60 day supply of uh, PPE for both teachers and students. These are both paper and disposable masks for stu students and teachers, a supply of hand sanitizer, um, uh, face shields uh, and higher grade uh, uh, masks for our nurses and, and those doing uh, our school nurse. Uh, that's actually me, and I'll show you how that's gonna come, but they're working on providing that, procuring that for us, similar to how they did the hospitals. Um, the Department of Ed recognized it's very difficult for schools to competitively get their hands on all of this. Um, we've been able to acquire some of these things ourselves already but it took effort and there was a little bit of price gouging going on out there in the, in the market. So this will be a better delivery for us. Next, the county has also provided their pathway to recovery and reopening our schools based on what the state has provided and work that uh, the County Office of Ed has done from around the state and other resources. So, and you can see their comments below on the bottom here about how they've partnered. So again, very general guidelines, no specific directives, following the local health, offic health official requirements, practicing the physical distancing, having a, dis uh, a distance learning plan and bringing students back on, very similar to what the state is. Uh, ICOE will be the distributor of that supply of PPE. So those, those items won't come directly from the state to us, they'll come through the County House of Education. Also to help us provide guidance is this, the roadmap to recovery from the Imperial County Public Health Department. I wanna point something out that's very specific that both the, the community and our board needs to understand, our parents and teachers, everyone needs to recognize how this is set up. Um, students can return to campus when we are at, at stage 2B. That's what it's called, stage 2B. Um, in stage one, that was nobody except essential workers can be out. In stage 2A, um, it's essential workers and also low risk workers, people who work very much by themselves. A very good example is this is like a grounds crew or a landscaper. They work by themselves. They just are out there working independently by themselves. And so they were allowed to return in stage two. And this is the variance as it's called where the county was able to allow more things to happen. Then they modified the stage two variance to allow things, for example, back in May, now they allow religious services um, and religious meetings with a variety of new limitations. And so even though it says stage two and we are given a set of rules, we are discovering, and we've all seen this, that these stages are modified and they get updated over time. The current, the most current information we have is that students can return to campus when we're in stage 2B. At this point in time, all employees, including teachers, could be required to come to work during stage 2A. 
again, this because teachers would be working by themselves in a classroom with no one else around them. And so that would be allowable in stage 2A. Uh, but stage 2B is when we can introduce students on campus with a variety of precautions. Some of these precautions, again, this is as of this, this has been updated as of last week, um, just like two business days ago. This may have been changed again, and we'll find out tomorrow and share this publicly. But daily health screens are required, but it does not have to be a temperature check um, unless they change that. But the latest that we've gotten officially from the county health department is that we have to do a daily health screening, but it does not have to be a health. Yet. I see Ms. Jones has got hers, but it does not. it's not required. We will be receiving um, the touch, touchless uh, temperature thermometers um, and we'll have them available at every school as an enhanced or an extra measure if there's a question or someone is not feeling well and they want to have their temperature take, taken, both employees or students, but it's not a requirement. We do have to have all the physical distancing precautions in place, masks when you cannot maintain six feet of distance, enhanced sanitizing and access to hand washing and hand sanitizing. And those are all things that are coming on board as we require those supplies and materials. Uh, the question around masks will be revisited in the next couple of days as the governor issued his order. But this, as of last week, was current information that masks are not required when you can maintain six feet of distancing. Like I see everyone on the screen is by themselves and not wearing a mask. But I noticed when we had the retirees there, there were two sitting near each other, a little bit apart, but they both had masks on. Very appropriate on all accounts. So in terms of what are our next steps, what are we as a district going to do with all this information? So first, summer preparations, what's happening right now? Uh, is principals have sent out their summer school letters that include information around plans for the fall, plans and information about registration and description of precautions. And schools are building their master schedules. We recently issued a survey this week to families to let us know if they would like to have distance learning for the semester or if they are okay with a blended learning when it's allowable. So that's how we are building master schedules to know which students and how many students are requesting which ones. So there's quite a bit of work happening this summer to prepare for the fall opening. Registration options. We have the traditional paper packet is being, is being uh, picked up at all the school sites when it's available in the middle of July. Um, we've enhanced it, we've streamlined it and made some reductions in the forms that there'll be less pieces of paper to fill out and it'll be a little more condensed. So it'll be a smaller packet and we've streamlined that. We worked actually throughout the year to make that happen. We've also restarted the online registration through ARIES. This was an initiative a few years ago that we felt was important to bring back. Uh, so this will be done somewhat of a pilot trial run to see how it was done. And we're working on getting that up and running and made available so families can register online um, as opposed to having to uh, come in person uh, to register. Next, a question about devices. As mentioned earlier, additional Chromebooks and MiFi devices for Borderlink, they have been purchased and they are uh, being delivered uh, during the summer. Students will be able to check out a Chromebook and or a <coughs> MiFi device as needed. This is per student, not per family. Uh, we won't be able to conduct school very well if um, the freshman needs the computer at the same time the senior needs the computer to get to a Zoom meeting in different periods or different classes. So this will be by student if needed. Uh, we'll provide a Chromebook, again, per student, not per device. Uh, we're not likely to ever return to Chromebooks in carts for regular classroom use. Even in the future, we're not likely to do that uh, because there'll always be a question of sanitization between class periods. So if devices are simply issued and given to students and students are responsible to bring them back and forth every day. I'm sure we'll experience some challenges and needs to have Chrome or additional uh, computers on campus for loaners for the day, uh, but that we'll face that challenge when we get there. We're also developing a model for how would we do this one-to-one -one initiative so that students are issued that Chromebook while they're here for the years. But we recognize that this is what used to be somewhat of a goal for districts is going to become our reality. This will be something that we will have to take on over the course of the next few years. This won't happen in just this summer, but over the course of the next one to two years, we'll have to get to this point. So what about our back to school professional development for all of our employees? Um, we will follow our already approved schedule. So we have an established calendar, which is available on the district website. And so we recognize the need to, to maintain that calendar. Um, so we'll follow that. Sessions that are traditionally in person are, are, will be converted to virtual meetings. So there'll be a meeting like this one, or they will be uh, videos and content for, the, for our staff to participate in. Um, all of our required training, such as sexual harassment and um, all those types of 
uh, bloodborne pathogens and all those things that are annual trainings that we do. Uh, they will be changed and we're working on a process to get those uh, to become um, virtual. In the event where staff does not have access to a device, uh, some of our staff don't have home computers, which is understandable and perfectly okay. We will provide opportunities where people can gather in a very large room, such as the theater, spread out with 30 and 40 feet around them and be able to participate in training as needed. So those will be some small groups for those types of presentations for those who don't have the opportunity to do it by themselves online. We'll have sessions on safety, both health, you know, personal care and what are the precautions that are needed to be taken. We actually provided that already to our custodians and mechanics and bus and um, uh, maintenance workers on personal safety and precautions for COVID-19. There'll be sessions on distance learning, both blended and hybrid uh, for best practices. How do we help our students uh, learn? How do we help our teachers teach? Uh, that's been, we've heard that over and over again from our staff that they want additional training on how to best do this. So those will be the topics for our back to school training. So what does day one look like? What is August 11th, our first day back likely to be? What is gonna happen? So number one, first and foremost, our safety precautions and expectations. Um, our plans are already aligned and approved by um, the County Health Department and ICOE. When we develop our plans, it does not require that we send it off and get a signature and a stamp to before we can begin using that. As long as we are aligned with all the guidance and information in their plans, then our plans are approved as well. And we've been in regular communication with the county and the uh, county health department. So again, safety precautions, daily health screening prior to coming to work or school, employee or student, no temperature taking is required, but it will be available. Again, masks when uh, persons cannot maintain six feet of physical distancing, and masks during passing periods. Even though at, at the most, um, we'll only have um, say a few hundred students on campus any given time, we're still gonna ask people to wear their masks during passing period as they would be coming and passing to each from each other and may come in contact with a classmate or another, uh, another person. There'll be new signs and reminders posted throughout the schools and offices, um, posters from CDE and um, other reminders, even about the daily health screening will become a large poster at the gates when students and employees come to work. There'll be hand sanitizer and we'll encourage regular hand washing, daily sanitizing of schools and buses. We've recently acquired a few devices that um, have been seen. Um, if you've done any, uh, watch the videos or, or newscasts, how airplanes are being sanitized. There's this spray that's emitted and it's electronically charged to help clean. We have those very similar devices um, to clean classrooms, buses, office spaces and public settings. So we have that same capacity. So this is where we're headed. As of June, Imperial County is experiencing still a surge uh, in cases. We're still on the increase. And so we are still in stage 2A. Uh, we cannot introduce students on campus until we're in stage 2B. Given this information and, and given the current status and the time it takes to plan and communicate, we are going to start with distance learning for all students. We feel it's in the best interest um, at this point in time with people taking their regular vacations and families and communicating with them that we will simply start with distance learning for the first quarter. It is possible that during the first quarter, we may introduce small groups of students while still maintaining all the physical distancing requirements when we get to stage 2B. So for example, let's say August 11th, the county says, hey, you can have kids on campus. We're still gonna start with distance learning for a while. We need to get back into the routine of learning and know exactly how many students we have and how many students we can have on campus and communicate those plans. So that'll take a little bit of time to get us all back up to speed that way. So when we introduce on-campus classes and meetings. Um, these are the two primary drivers of why this is important. We know that distance learning works well for many, but not for all. So we are deeply concerned with equity issues, meaning how well am I getting access to the learning based on my ability to learn online and learning loss that occurred in the fourth quarter and over the summer break. So these are two issues that kind of push us towards the need to return to regular instruction as soon as it is safe and practical. So according to the guidance from the County Health Department, we will introduce students on campus in small groups first. For example, it may just be CTE classes. Uh, like Miss Amanda Hill, it, after a while, it's really hard to do a cooking class on your own every day at home and submit a video. Uh, I'm sure she would appreciate having a small batch of kids that everyone can be spread out and do some um, direct practice and lab work. Our English learners need to have more engagement with their English learner teachers on a more regular basis. There's only so much we can do via distance learning that way. 
our special education students. Interestingly, we had reports from staff that many students actually performed better online. However, some students performed worse or didn't perform at all. And so we're deeply concerned about the need of our special education students and meeting the requirements of the individual education plans. Some of our science labs cannot be done online. They need to be done in person. Also music and other performance groups like dance and drama. Um, I, I, we see the tremendous things that have occurred. We've seen those videos um, of our own students doing the bring them back the lab experience with them as soon as it's available. So that's how we would in first introduce is, is having small groups probably by classes, by topic, not by number, but have small groups first. As we get in through various phases of, of implementation or phases of instruction, again, the two drivers are we're concerned with equity and we're concerned with learning loss. Those are the two important things that you would hear from the state and we're, we are reiterating them to you. Distance learning for all students, but some will continue for the semester of the full year. We think this is an important option. As you saw in the survey results, around 30 to 35% of our families are going to request distance learning for their children for the duration of at least the semester, if not the year. Again, for their reasons, maybe that the child themselves is medically fragile or they have a child in the home, um, but there's a need for distance learning. So that will be an option that we'll provide throughout. We want to introduce again, small groups by subject matter in limited numbers. But at some point in time, when we're in stage 2B, we can then begin to introduce blended but still in limited numbers to maintain physical distancing, oh, that's misspelled, I apologize for the typo there, of 25% students in a classroom. This would be between, depending on their class, six to 10 students per class. And so um, that would allow the students to be spread out uh, really, and this also means there's only 25% of the students on the bus. So there's lots of concern about who can ride the bus, but if only 25% of the students are coming to school and even a portion of that are doing distance learning, it's also a smaller load on the buses. Um, it's a smaller load in passing period, use of restrooms, use of the cafeteria. And so people will be able to spread out without much of a problem. At some point in time, we believe that they will allow us to bring more students on campus and we can increase that to twice a week, basically having 50% of the students coming. When we say 25% of the students, that's one group on say Tuesday, another group on Wednesday, a third group on Thursday and a fourth group on Friday. When we get to number four, that's a student say on Tuesday and Thursday and another batch of kids that is Wednesday and Friday. So that allows us to bring in an increased number of students. And then eventually at some point in time, which this may not happen until next, the following school year, 21-22, we can have all of our students attend a full day of school. So we recognize that these are how we will phase students in. One of our biggest challenges with this actually is not, is not just us doing this. One of our challenges is coordinating with our feeder school districts. We recognize that when we bring 25% of the students on campus. For us, that is a certain portion of the alphabet. Say, for example, the letters A through D. But if our feeder districts are doing something different and on a different day, if they're doing letters when we're doing something on Tuesday and they're doing a different batch on Tuesday, we may have the wrong families. So we need to try and coordinate family groups as best as we can by last name. It's a little mind boggling when we try and think about the fact that we are in essence trying to coordinate six different school districts with six different superintendents and governing boards and teachers associations and teachers. But that in essence is what we're trying to do is to have our district and the five feeder districts somewhat as best as we can align this process of phasing in kids back on campus so they can learn from their teachers directly. So that is the daunting task that we have been given. Okay. Um, and this is, this is being shared and coordinated with our feeder districts. Um, I will share with you that in my last conversation, um, superintendents are all leaning or have already decided that they will start with distance learning. Um, we're already leaning to having Monday be our distance learning day for all students, even the blended students, and that Tuesday through Friday become the instructional days when we are able to. But those aren't official. Those aren't fully synced up plans. Those are initial conversations. But we are working in that effort to coordinate that. Um, and we will then soon talk about what portion of the alphabet comes on which day, because at least we'll have a good shot at coordinating families are all on the same page. So that way, if my elementary kid who goes to McCabe and my high school kid who goes to Southwest they would go to school on the same day. That would make a lot of sense as opposed to mixing that up. That would be very hard to do. So again, 
A lot of questions come up about athletics and extracurricular co and co-curricular activities. Athletics will follow all the guidelines and rules set forward by CIF. Uh, we'll add those links to our webpage and we cannot start practice until we are in stage 2B. Matter of fact, all the athletic directors were in a meeting just today and were and received the same information that though we cannot have practices of any kind, even informally over at the park when we're getting together are not allowed. And so that's been communicated to our coaches as well. Uh, we do want all of our sports to have the same opportunities. So um, it's been made pretty clear in terms of equity, as we mentioned before, that for example, cross country, even though you're running by yourself, it's not very fair to the kid who's a football player um, that they may not be able to do it. So CIF has chosen to group them all together. We recognize that some parts of San Diego County whom we compete with are allowed to have practices um, and they're a little further along than we are, but we are not. Uh, it's unfortunate that we're not everyone in our section is on the same page uh, or, or have the same conditions, but we don't have, we have different conditions, are more restrictive. So other activities will follow the same phases. Um, and as soon as we can have students return, we can have uh, small events at schools and activities when it's permissible and we have larger groups when that threshold becomes, you know, you can have a gathering of 250 or a gathering of 500, those types of things, then we can add um, recitals and concerts. And uh, even when we get to athletics, we hope that we can add fans in the stands, even, even if it's just the parents, we'd like to be able to have parents be spectators. Um, at this point in time, we have to phase all these things in and follow the guidance that we've been, been excuse me, that have been provided. So there's implications on funding. And as you know, we just saw the, the, the presentation and the budget was adopted, but the rules are still not known at this time. Even as of today, uh, there's trailer bill language being developed and we're starting to hear little elements of it, but we don't have the rules yet. So there's discussion of this hold harmless funding level, which is we think what's going to happen the same, but they're adding all types of participation requirements, which we are just now learning about. But it is things like taking attendance, measuring how much the students are participating in learning, and what are the follow-up procedures? How do the school communicate with families? So these are all types of new requirements that may be imposed upon us. But we and we'll work with our associations for some flexibility. For example, if we're still in distance learning and we need to contact families, a question comes up. Since our bus drivers aren't driving the bus, can they maybe make some phone calls, right? Maybe they can come in and help us with some phone calls to track down students that aren't participating. Same with our campus security officers. If there aren't students on campus to watch over, maybe some of our other jobs can help us with some of these challenges that we'll have to help find and, and communicate with families and support learning. So there's all types of things that we may still need to do in order to make this happen. And we don't know how this will affect our current distance learning plan, our teacher and student expectations, and we'll need to modify these throughout the course of the year as we learn more information. And I mean school year starting now year, um, not just during the year right as we go forward. So it's really important we think about flexibility adjustments and communication. Conditions and stages are going to change throughout the summer and during the school year. What we learn and what we know will change um, pretty regularly. The same way we went into cl to closing campus in the fourth quarter with all types of new information, we believe it'll be similar, but hopefully going the, in a more uh, positive direction where we're opening things up. So we'll need to be really flexible in our approach and not get locked into one set pattern. Hopefully we can create consistency with the knowledge that these things will be updated as we slowly open up our schools again. We'll be making changes to who's attending on campus, how many group sizes and what type of meeting types that can happen. And we'll communicate this officially on the district webpage. We'll use our social media to point to the district webpage. Uh, but what we'll do is on this page here, if you were to follow the link, which there's a screenshot next, I believe, yep, is this is what this page looks like. Um, this is called the COVID-19 recovery plan page. Um, there are links on the left-hand side for various things that are important. And again, this is just a screenshot, not live. Uh, but this is as of June 10th, we were at stage 2A, which is low risk. And when we're at stage 2B, we can then have things, um, folks come on campus. So we encourage the public uh, board members, staff to, to refer to this page um, for information. And we'll do our best to keep it updated and current um, with the most, most current information that we have. So at this point in time, love to hear any comments or questions from the board if there's anything you'd like to discuss or recommendations or questions you may have. Uh, Dr. Andrews or Steve? Yes. 
you know, one of the things is our district has always been as a really great uh, community resource for all sorts of groups that want to use our facilities, whether it's a gym or an athletic field or something like that. Do we have a plan in place for that? Or are we just going to put everybody on hold? Uh, currently, we put everyone on hold because of the stage that we're in. So when the county um, lets us go, when, when we as a county move to stage two and those things can happen, we would then be able to modify our facility use agreements to allow those things to happen with the requirements that are expected by the county. So there are, there are certain requirements that are being imposed right now around group gathering sizes and there are variances that are provided and it takes all different types of approvals to make those things happen. At this point in time, um, we as a district would comply with those requests and be coordinating with the county. We also oftentimes, um, at this point in time, we haven't had any of those that would be outside of those variances or had those requests, um, but we would communicate and you know double check with say, our police or fire department uh, to see if their plans were in harmony with that. Um, we also have developed a COVID-19 facility use waiver um, in the event that someone you know use our facility, it holds the district harmless uh, if they feel like they got it while at one of our facilities during somebody else's event. So uh, we have taken a look at how does that how does that work. Yes. Thank you. I got a question. Yes, Mr. Jimenez. I have a question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, that the our employees will have to adapt and have adaptability to uh, to perform other duties as assigned. Have there been any preliminary meetings, uh, tentative meetings with uh, uh, employee? Uh, Group leaders uh, as to their... uh, th those are those are discussions that will get started here very soon. Um, we actually have negotiate or a, a, a meeting set up with our classified staff coming up in the next few days um, to revisit our current COVID nineteen MOU um, and also with their teachers, our side letter that we have with with our teachers. And so those, as we've learned these new things, we recognize there's different needs that we have, and so we'll work with our employee groups to. Um, to work through some of those challenges and request how we can best employ people. So that's coming up. Thank you. Thank you. A number of schools in San Diego are outside of the scope of CIF and work with AAU. And that's, they're the ones that are causing some of us to have headaches. Yeah, yeah we, we have uh, made it very clear to our coaches that um, we, we are still going to comply with the, the, the mandate and the requirement and not to use AAU as a way or to work around. Uh, okay, work good, around. thank you. And we as, as superintendents of high schools have been um, very uniform on that. And even we have said, if we were to get a start date of say July 25 and say as of that date, we would all make sure that we communicate in advance that that would be the official date, if, if that were to be the date. But we've already kind of agreed that we'll step together for athletics in the county together, even though we can't be in full sync with the rest of the other folks. But we, we as county district can do this together. Okay. Okay, is there any other uh, comment or questions? Okay, well then hearing none. We will move on to our ECSTA and CSEA comments. And um, I know that Mr. Duenas was here in attendance earlier. What about Ms. Mora? Is she here? Uh, she's not. She's not here at the moment. Okay. Well, then uh, we'll let the gentleman go first, Mr. Duenas. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, just a few comments. Um, so I've been working with uh, several entities. Um, the count had a meeting last week with the county health department and um, the school, uh, the, the county board of supervisors. And I asked them the particular uh, question as to how do we move from 2A to 2B? And I mean, not, not, uh, uh, not because I didn't understand the process, but because I wanted to see what was being done by the county health department. And they expressed that they currently have plans to increase testing throughout the county. Um, which leads me to, to believe that um, it, it's going to be a long time before we be, are able to move to 2B um, because as more people are tested, um, well, obviously more people will be found to have uh, either have some symptoms or, um, you know, or, or have the virus. Um, but, but the county health department expressed that that was a, a better plan for them 
to make sure that uh, you know we get these people who are potentially infected um, quarantined and, and out of uh, contact with people that are not uh, infected. Uh, so that's one thing that, uh, that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, another thing is that um, in meeting with um, the group that you guys, the Dr. Andrews alluded to, um, shared with you guys in his presentation uh, that includes uh, the ICOE, um, I, I met today with Dr. Fennell and um, Renato Montaño and some uh, superintendents of other districts and presidents of other um, associations. And one of the things that, um, that I got from that meeting was that um, even though we are trying to, as, a, as an organization, um, go to a one-to-one -one for, for uh, devices, one thing to consider is that even though the border link um, system is available for those students who cannot provide their own uh, Wi-Fi. Um, there are blind spots within the border link system in cities like Sealy, I believe. And I, I asked that question to Renato and he said that um, they did have um, their, their tech people aware of where these blind spots were and that they were going to pursue ways to find, you know, other companies, whether it be Verizon or Sprint or some other um, companies that would allow them to meet those needs. Um, you know, get these people that live in those blind spot areas access to internet through either the border link system or through other, some, um, through other programs. And I would encourage our board to consider to use some of that CARES Act funding to help uh, meet those needs. I don't know if it would be a cost to, um, to ICOE to expand their border link um, but if necessary, you know, we should um, make funds available if, if some of our students do not have internet access. Um, and another thing is also as, as it seems like, um, well, not as it seems, but we are going to 100% online to begin the school year. One thing that we've learned is that uh, through the summer school program was um, that some students did not know where to find uh, the access codes to the Google Classrooms. And I've made suggestions to the pertinent people that are running these programs uh, that are setting things up for registration to try to make sure that, uh, that they verified that by the first. We lost you. We lost him. I lost it. audio. Oh, there you go. Yeah, we'll, we'll give him a second to come back on because this is the end of the meeting, so. He needs a Wi-Fi booster. Yeah. I'm going to send him a quick text message. Okay. Yeah, he might be in Sealy in one of those dead zones. Yeah. He lives in Imperial. I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> Well, while he, we will wait for him to rejoin us, or hope I just sent him a text message. Um, he's got a very good, very good points. I appreciate so much the the association right. being engaged this way. Um, it's they have been all along. Our teachers association has been part of our. We we called them think tanks or these you know task force groups to try and solve problems and raise questions and think clearly through all these challenges. And Mr. Duenas, um, along with many other teachers, have been part of that group. Um, as a matter of fact, even tomorrow morning, there's another one, uh, another session scheduled for people to join in the conversation and work through challenges and questions that come up as we get closer and finalizing plans uh, for reopening. So very much appreciate that. And, and like he mentioned, summer school has been a wonderful testing ground for distance learning in a, in a new model, right? We know summer school has a fixed opening and a fixed end date. Um, the curriculum moves a little faster. Students are only in two classes. Um, the, the expectations for students and teachers were changed from the fourth quarter to this. And so again, we're able to learn from our experience from the fourth quarter and do it better during summer school. And that's what one thing that Mr. Duenas was talking about. Mr. Jimenez? Yes, uh, I don't understand. Uh, forgive my ignorance. Of what, what does he mean by access codes? Uh, the students don't have actual access codes that are available to get to them. Sure. So each each course, each Google Classroom, say Mr. Jimenez's first period class 
um, Google Classroom has a code. It's like a, a number of digits, letters, and combination. It's it's a so you type that into your Google, and then you can then connect to your your. Well, like we connect to virtual with the code that they they provide. I got Very sort of how you get to this meeting. There's this link, and so in essence, that's what it is. And what we discovered is that. Um, we were there, we need to do a better job of communicating those access codes so that people can find those access codes. Um, and the other thing that we learned, um, and I, I haven't, I wonder if Mr. Duenas if when I had this question, actually I have a meeting with him on Friday, um, I'll ask him, but we learned from other districts that when schools use different platforms and say, Ms. Jones uses, you know, Schoology and Mr. Jimenez uses Google Classroom, that's hard for students to go from yeah. different platforms. Uh, and so we have told our staff that um, we, we need to be on one platform and we've already invested much training and time in Google Classroom. Um, and so that's where we're pointing all of our, our classes to be on that same platform. So it's easier for students to navigate where all the content is, where do I turn in assignments? It's all very much the same uniform. Thank you. I think Mr. Zoyas is back. Yes, I am. Oh, good. Um, just one, one last thing. I'm not sure when I got cut off, but um, uh, <laughs> hopefully you were talking for five minutes before you realized. <laughs> um, did, did you guys hear? Yeah, you guys did talk about that one part. Um, well, I, I was also concerned about the, the results of the survey um, as we had a 30% participation rate. Um, you know, would it be possible to get, um, I guess, more information since it was an online format. We don't know who does not have access. Therefore, if people aren't responding, maybe it's because they simply don't have access. Um, so maybe send the survey out in the summertime and see if we can get more, more respondents. Um, that might be an, an idea. Um, I just want to also share with you guys that, um, and I keep harping about a retirement incentive, but Calexico is currently today, um, well, not today, but this week they are considering a retirement incentive for those teachers um, that are of the high risk category and are, you know, really concerned about returning to work in August. Um, and this would be made available to teachers that um, missed the deadline that we have, like in February. And so basically these teachers would be given a $10,000 paycheck to retire um, by August 1st. Uh, so that might be something for us to consider. It's also, again, a cost savings measure. $10,000 is a lot less than a two-year service credit. Um, I, I, I shared with the president of Calexico, I don't see many teachers taking it, but some teachers may. Uh, so just wanted to share that with you as well. And that's all my comments. Thank you. All right. Um... And unless Mrs. Ms. Mora has joined us, that will be the end of our comments. And we have no further items in closed session. So unless uh, I'm misreading the agenda, I, I think that we can adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, Ryan. Hey. Thank you, I'll be safe. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Take care, bye-bye. Thank you, Arnold. A lot of work you put into it. Thank you. Have a good night, all. Be safe.